All right, I think we can start. Welcome everyone to this very special holiday edition of the SCORC uh, virtual lecture series. We have a really exciting uh, program today with Fabian giving the lecture entitled Ingle Else, Ingle Else, uh, my letter to Santa on what single cell can bring next year. And um, so the lecture will be starting soon. We have an uh, overwhelming amount of people that are listening to the talk today. So welcome everyone. It's great to have you all here. And I just want to have a brief announcement um, uh, before we go into today's lecture of, of the upcoming lecture that will be in the next year, February 1st. And uh, just uh, to let you know, we are changing the schedule. We are not anymore having the lectures Friday mornings. Um, in order to incorporate all the people from US, we are actually having um, this series now Wednesdays at 4 p.m. So mark your calendar February 1st. We will have Hedda Wademann from the DKFZ in Heidelberg speaking. And now it's, uh, ah, okay, yes. Um, how can you ask questions after the talk? Um, so Fabian will give a 30 minute presentation and afterwards we have 15 minutes time for questions that I will be moderating. And you can either raise your hand and I will ask you to, to speak, or you can also write your question in the chat and then I can um, read it. And I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Barbara Treutlein uh, from ETH Zurich. And now it's my really great pleasure to introduce Fabian. Fabian, I, I don't think needs much of an introduction. He's really a, a leader and, and pioneer in, in the field of computational biology and in very particular using AI, using and developing AI-based methods for single cell omics, for spatial omics. And his lab has had a lot of major and pioneering contributions to the single cell genomics and, and single cell omics in general field. Um, starting early on with uh, coming up with ways of inferring trajectories to predicting perturbations, to uh, performing integrations, most recently really um, facilitating integration of atlases, um, comparison to reference atlases. And, and so there's just really an, an incredible amount of work that has come from Fabian's lab in, in the past years in, in our field. And I, Fabian has won a lot of prizes, and I just want to mention two recent awards. He has awards. He has um, been elected as EMBO member, and very recently he has been awarded uh, the, the highest uh, renowned uh, prize in Germany, the Gottfried um, Wilhelm Leibniz Prize. So um, yeah, congrats, Fabian, and we are all excited to listen to your talk. Yeah, thanks so much, Barbara, for, for sharing this and uh, for the kind, very kind introduction. It's, it's great seeing you. It's great seeing everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I think you might have been able to fill the little stars in the title announcement. It's, of course, jingle bells. And my thing is jingling, but I will take it off um, because otherwise I can't properly talk and just will share my screen. So uh, this is such an old joke again that I thought you could just like try it again. So you might know this ad from, from Jim Bean. I really like it. Don't forget the J and B. That's kind of sweet, right? So yeah, we maybe put in the S and C, but I think where we, we know where we go. So what I want to talk a little bit about today is uh, in the next sort of 30 minutes, and I really try to be on time. So let me just stop my timer here. Um, I want to briefly tell you what I think could be exciting new avenues in the single cell field that are sort of now just on, on, on the verge of, of becoming bigger. Obviously, it's like a super personal thing. And I think everyone would go for different different other aspects. And I would be really excited also at the end, maybe to get your input uh, on that. So this is my my little Santa letter I would like to do. And on the wish list, maybe, you know, what's like a brand new essay or a brand new, uh, maybe maybe a thing to go. And, you know, these, these type of questions, typically maybe Barbara would be more prone to fill. So I might be focusing a bit more on sort of some of the an analysis things that I would wish for or that I think are just coming up. And, you know, this is obviously as always uh, a pretty much last minute thing and a bit preliminary. So you bear with me and um, I'm sure I've forgotten 
many things and I might be overstressed, some things that I've just, uh, just recently been doing, but I'd be happy to, to get your feedback. I tried to get some feedback early on from the lab, and this is what, what the lab thought would be sort of really important um, things that are coming up in, 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 in the field from experimental design towards multiple modalities, for example, single support yomics coming up, integration, of course, but then also the interpretability, which I find actually quite interesting and exciting. And last but not least, I think a lot of these spatial essays are becoming a big thing. So I tried to somehow summarize and, and, and put things into, into a three-dimensional coordinate system of what I want to tell you now. And I want to talk for one thing about that we will be getting better, really better models, right? I think we really have now more of a grasp of how to integrate, how to deal with modalities, how to deal with batch variation, how to include, for example, dynamics now. We've been obviously for a long time, the field has been interested in trajectories, right? Like how can we put this in? And then the whole engineering is part of it. Um, the data sets becoming bigger and bigger and more diverse and more, just more, you know, I think we will soon be having quite, quite easily like 10 million PBMCs or so to query and then see on top. So the question is, when do we stop? When do we add things on top? So I think there's really exciting avenues happening and many of these atlases will become available during this year. And last but not least, of course, modalities will be a thing that could be the spatial one, which I just for one, whatever reason I put there, I guess you could put it here as well. And, um, and to keep to the spirit of the season, you know, let's just add a little bit of snow on top of that and get our three-dimensional axis in here. Okay. So that that's that that was it about with the Christmas jokes. So um let me get started with the the atlases. So for that, you know, in the human cell atlas, we've been, I think, for a long time trying to really build this sort of coordinate system of uh or, or this this periodic system of cell types, right? As a description of the disassociated um RNA seq and then other other type of modalities that we have been generating. And then most later, then of course, also thinking how a spatial equivalent of that would look like. My lab particularly has been focusing on, on the lung, doing a bunch of atlas, and I mentioned this one in a minute, um, as, as well as, for example, uh, um, on the gut, this one with particular the Schiller lab, as well as many partners, this one with the Heiko Likert lab. So this was one of the major things we've been doing uh, this year, because you know, whenever you talk to Santa, you also say how you behave this year. So I will be doing a little bit of things that we've been doing, which I think will sort of influence what, what we do in the lab and what I think can be also done in, in these atlasing things. And this was worked by, by, by Lisa and, and um, Malte together with a, a whole bunch of parts, particularly Sasha and Martin and the whole human lung cell atlas network, which really proved to be instru instrumental to take a bunch of, of, of lung adult uh, human lung data sets and harmonize them. And then also harmonize the metadata of all of these as well as anatomy education. So all of this sort of putting together uh, made us clear that, you know, just us, pure computationalist, like starting our integration method and then generating something that overlaps, it doesn't really go so far. So there's so many specialized uh, annotation, very deeply hierarchical ones, so much prior than known to uh, really then take into account where, if to integrate, when to integrate, also at, at which points maybe not to integrate and sort of keep it as a separate thing if you're you know, very strong disease phenotype or something like that. And you know, I think we really made an effort there to build what we first called the core, and then use transfer learning, and I'm going to be mentioning that concept on the learning part in a minute, to then build an even bigger atlas that was then sort of including variation about population. And this population is, of course, not as diverse as you want. Essentially, it was just gathered together from multiple things, from multiple sources. So, you know, HCA in particular is focusing also on increasing that diversity. But once you have this, you can now ask a bunch of queries. So I think not just like this building of these atlas, but the questions how we use them is really being asked anew. And early approaches such as, and you might remember SC map from Hamburg lab and so on, but I think really been sort of questioned anew what type of programs can we extract? And we have a few of these vignettes and examples in there, but of course there's much more to be done. But in a sense, this has been a bit of an example for us. And I think there will be much of those similar type of approaches now coming up for, for other organs. They have been already in, in, in parts and I think they will be very specialized also depending on the organ. For example, you know, in the brain, we will have one of these very big references uh, that's from only a few subjects Then you might have maybe um, region specific, more heterogeneous ones, also maybe very specific disease ones. But then also um, thinking about how to do this not only within, but also across organs, for example, an immune atlas, right? Or um, um, including also organoids. You know, for example, Barbara has been showing quite a few of these uh, uh, examples are already very strong. I think this is 
exciting. And for me, it's personally exciting because it really involves a whole bunch of, yeah, um, needs where you where you need to deal also with methodological questions. I think it's not clear and, and not straightforward just to, um, yeah, throw everything together, but you need to take, for example, time structure into account. You need to uh, deal with with the the, the different speci specialities of, of particular tissue. You might just have nucleus data available and so on. So I think this actually needs some method development. One thing that we found interesting is that you know, for, in order to integrate, there's a bunch of approaches, and many of these, particularly those scalar ones, are, 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 are built on on auto encoders at the moment. Um, um, uh, things that, that, for example, SCVI from from Nia has been been uh, a pioneering at our, our, our deep count auto encoder. And what is typically done there is that you add a condition, so you build what's called a conditional variational auto encoder. And this condition is then the batch and is then being removed in the latent space. Our our idea here is now, if we really go to many, many subjects, and you in PBMCs, this is happening, this will happen in, other, in others as well. And also in this lung case, we had more than a few hundred already samples. This conventional encoding as categories, machinery you call this often one hot encoding, is not the right thing because you actually want to see sort of which ones should be closer by, which ones not. So instead, we build an embedded uh, um, latent space. So we essentially have a space that sort of tells you about those different source variations. And this is going to be trained at the same time as this big thing. This is what we call population level integration because you can then actually visualize that. At the same time, you also include cell type transformation because it wasn't, it was this, this scan VI method that also uses this prior to actually then really be performing well in many of the, the, the comparisons that we've been doing. And this thing actually then outperforms this quite a bit. So it's actually really, really interesting. What it does, we sort of have a, a, a prototype learning in addition for cell type labels. And then we have those reference landmarks, which you can easily transfer. So if you now have a new query that you want to map on top of these atlas, you just learn these new embeddings in this, this vector space. And you also learn potentially new cell types in the query or you map to other ones. So you can transfer labels right away. So this solves these two tasks of not just embedding, but also label transfer. And you know, that's that's that related things. I should, I mentioned scan the eye, there's other there's other approaches, particularly from Nias Lab. Now with this, for example, we were able to build an, an eight million cell atlas to get started and then really uh, scale up things and then embed it. And I, you know, I, I don't want to really explain much about it. I just want to make the point because this has now more than 2,000 samples. Each of these dots is actually a subject from which you have PBMCs available. So each of these dots has something like a 1,500 cells beneath it. And you see now the variation of this embedding space. And you see that, for example, co or this is in this case, data sets cluster together, but there's also sort of a general trend in first principle component of, uh, um, I think, essay or something like that. And then also um, other, other variations for, for example, what type of sample handling soon has been done. So you can visualize this and you can interpret and understand this integration procedure better. And maybe also know, in this case, maybe you should not integrate. The last thing I want to say for the atlasing is the upscaling of things. I just put our example here, but there's there's a bunch of labs now starting to really curate, for example, the whole uh, cell by gene. In our case, we use this this FIRA database that we set up locally. Um, I should mention this is work by, by David and Felix in particular, where we build now this late data suit that actually has more than 30 million of these of, of, of cells across organs now available in human. And, what, and the question is, can you, for example, learn a joint maybe embedding, or can you learn a joint classifier for cell types? You know, and I think what we see is that these current models that we do, these typically build on fully connected neural networks and not very deep, they cannot really use this available data complexity. So that's why I think uh, our organization is just very specific. It's like in computer vision or in language, I know these big models coming up, but we're still sort of in our field, we're still sort of on these, on these smaller scales. And I think what we see, particularly in computer vision, particularly from this ImageNet challenge, you know, these early predictors, they did a good job in terms of sort of predicting uh, content of an image. But once these deep learning approaches started really taking off and become complex, deep, I mean, this deep part is really important here. Suddenly those classifiers were going through the roof. And I think this will be happening in our field as well. And for this, you know, we've been currently trying up with, with predictor for cell type properties, and this seems to be working quite well, but I'm sure there's, there's other approaches. And um, I hope we, we have something like this uh, coming up next year. So this was uh, from, from, from data and atlasing side, but you know, I sort of transition already towards models. And I think this idea of contextualizing our models, actually adding constraints that potentially then learning about dynamics and regulation. I think this is really important. We saw with these, one of these big approaches in machine learning last year, you know, uh, AlphaFold 
was based on the fact that you actually put in some information about some of the physical properties into the model. And I think similar in our case, you know, we will, if you put in constraints, we actually learn more about the model. So we have, and this is again, just, just from, from our lab, an extension of, of modern complexities by incre incre increasing sort of constraints to latent space. But there's, I think, more similar approach to the literature, which I haven't you know, reviewed. But what I wanted to sort of say as a general thing, and this is really a very nice, nice, nice perspective from Akwarishi and, and Peter Sorga, Nature Methods, just last year, where they say, you know, in, in many of um, sort of other machine learning settings, we add constraints. For example, in spatial things, we add that, you know, neighboring pixels have something to do with each other. In, in speech, in language, we sort of look into neighboring size. In, in, in 3D structure, we, we, we want something to be rotation invariant. How, and how can we do this in our field where, you know, we do have a lot of uh, data-driven approaches, but, you know, we do have first principles. We know that there's like a good description of this particular signaling pattern. We know that, you know, this, this cell type is a progenitor of, of this one. How can we build this in? Can we maybe learn it? Like, of course, the inference, or can we maybe put it into the model? And, and what they describe there is that you could maybe combine these two approaches. They call this differential biology, but essentially, if you make sure that your sort of typically much smaller scale model is, is uh, differentiable, then you can actually put it into this data-driven one. You know, and this is something that's actually working out. So if you reuse these primitive at these price, this can actually work. For example, spatial context in, 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 in our setting is typically sort of container cells. That is sort of this natural unit, right? So if we put now uh, this, this cell neighborhood as a prior to the network, in this case, this is something in machine called graph new networks. And you can actually use this and you can learn about cell communication. Or if you take a principle-based approach, namely, um, for example, unspliced genes became spliced from RNA velocity or, or just some, some regulatory part, you can then actually put this together with a data-driven approach. This was worked together with uh, particular uh, Adam Gayoso and, uh, from, from Nier's lab and Philip from my lab uh, with this VLOVI approach to then sort of have these, these constraints put into these super flexible deep learning models and suddenly we are put, um, um, improving. The second principle, which I, I, I want to mention here, is this idea of, of transferring information. So typically, you know, we do analysis by analysis by analysis. If as a toolbox manager, this is something we share, but the models and the results, we don't share so much. And a big trend in, in machine learning, I think at the moment, is to also have model repositories, model sharing. We tried this a little bit with Spira. Um, there's a bunch of really popular machine learning based model repos, such as Hugging Face. And I think these, these ideas could be coming to us. So basically, no, don't do these things separately, but learn from one to, to the other. And yeah, we had, we had one approach recently. This was uh, um, um, work fantastically driven by uh, Mo Lutfulai from the lab, where you sort of have a reference and you project on top of this. And there's other approaches from. Um, um, Raoul's lab, for example, where you also can take a reference and, and then, then map on top of this. And he's been particular Raoul pioneering a lot of these ideas also across modalities. And I think this is a very exciting avenue to come. And I should, should really um, stress here that you're know, learning a map is really more than just annotation transfer than just like predicting cell type labels. And I think we can really do, do more with this. You can sort of learn about uncertainties, about transitions, uh, dynamics, and so on. So if we uh, now know how to make these, these better models, maybe let's just jump back to then what type of additional constraints or sort of information we can actually take. And I think for this perturbation will become quite a big thing. This is from a review that we recently did on, on perturbations, which I now won't, won't go into detail, but the idea is if you have a perturbation or system, um, you could try to include that information into your model. And these perturbations could be, you know, drugs, could be a, a CRISPR-based screen, or it could be also human genetics. And, you know, depending on these, you might use very different approaches, but you can embed this information in your learning, or you can sort of an, a posteriori analyze it. But in many cases, you will observe that, you know, just dealing with it as you would do in a normal differential setting. So A versus B, this is not going to cut it because these going to get, huge and there's going to be some dependency behind it and for example we recently did a paper at NURBS where we just con contain sort of add this chemical information as similarity build this into the model and thereby sort of get a better predictor for this and there's many other approaches happening in in the lab Caroline Uller for example uh, in, 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 the, in the world Caroline Uller for example has been really pushing uh, this 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 idea of adding uh, causality in, into that mix and actually also coming up with very exciting challenges in this direction 
this is one 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 example again you know one of contextualized in the lab that that Mo Yuge Carlo and 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 Nacho have been doing uh, in 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 the lab to really do these perturbation models. There's other ideas, but you know we like these autoencoder type of infrastructures. And now we we add a constraint to a latent space as you saw from before. In this case. Perturbation could be drug, it also works for, for, for CRISPR-based perturbations. We say we want to learn interactions, so we add basically each of those terms separately, and these directions in latent space, we learn as an embedding. I should stress this work uh, collaboration with Anna and, and David from Facebook AI. And if, if you do this, then you can also go towards prediction of novel combinations or a drug response in latent spaces. And since then, quite a few cool ideas have been coming up from, from various labs, how to drive this, this type of perturbation modeling approach further and interpolate in unknown regions and latent space. So how to do this really going into unknown regions, I think touches upon one of the, yeah, one of the core aims, I would say, of cell, at least of computation cell biology. For us, I think one of the holy grails for sure has always been we want to understand and maybe estimate a regulatory network. And this was one of the main reasons why I think we went into this whole single cell field to begin with, because you have thought like if we have many samples, you know, maybe even just uh, those two correlations, maybe already all the interactions drop out. Turns out it's not as simple, but you know, I think the, the field may really making exciting new steps towards that. One of the key first ones for me that really gets more mechanistic was this, this beautiful idea from Peter Kachenko and Stinnenness and about RNA velocity. And, and in particular, of course, uh, Jolie, uh, who has been, been driving this research, where you know the idea is that if you have unspliced and spliced reads that you can actually now quantify in, 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 uh, in single cell RNA seq data, you just build a model for this metabolismic, sort of for this reaction. And you, know, you don't, don't assume regulation to get started with, you assume really no regulation model, just global constants, but then you can put these things together and you write a very simple model for that. You can estimate it. And for each gene, you can see, you know, if you have more unspliced and spliced, this, this, this transcript is just being made, otherwise it's being degraded. So you can estimate something like transcription rates, put all of them together and you get sort of a dynamic on this, this state manifold. Obviously this has all kinds of restrictions, you know, no, no regulation, what? And, uh, like uh, same rates everywhere. And so there's a bunch of extensions we did as uh, one that was was quite popular called SCVLO, and then we built sort of then also methods using this these 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 vector later these these vector spaces that give you additional information. But since then, I, I think it really gives the opportunity to really go towards understanding regulation. And I think there's really exciting renewed interest if you check around what type of papers came out recently uh, beyond just this uh, this real VI that I was showing. A lot of methods, also critical approaches, saying, "Hey, RNA velocity doesn't work in so many cases." But then, you know, maybe we can use long read sequencing, or we use more complex modeling approaches. Came out, and I think getting together in that community and and discussing and and maybe seeing what real steps we can do, I think, will be an exciting topic for for twenty three. The second thing, and now this goes also to work that uh, Barbara has been doing in her lab, but also Sam Morrison and others, is this estimation of regulatory networks. So really now try to use the multimodality, try to use a tag to tell you something about potential enhancers, or at least the sort of regulation regions, and combine this, uh, Stein in particular, also with his senior, you know, senior Cruz has been pioneering quite a lot of work there. I just put this this one plot here from, from um, 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 Barbara, in particular, uh, Jonas's work on this tool called Pando, which really tries to put together an, a GRN framework in the spirit similar to Cell Oracle and then also Cynic, I, I would I would I would say to then essentially allow you to estimate um, some regulatory ac activity and then also potentially look into that. And I think what's kind of cool is that you know with Sam's work here, you can then sort of propagate forward and try to see that if you if you change something related to network, what types of effects you have. So you can really combine this with perturbation data. I think it's very exciting, and I will expect a a, a bunch of of extensions uh, of of these ideas, potentially including causality, as we briefly mentioned before uh, in the future. So so much for for the disassociated setting. Let let's think about the spatial aspect of things. And you know there, I th I think. One of the most exciting things is, you know, we came into the single cell biology from a microscope. By the way, here, beautiful review, old one, but please check it out from uh, Jan Philipp Juncker and Alex van Udenaden. Every cell is special, uh, eight years old already. But, you know, at the time, you know, these things are really this separate. And since then, obviously, you know, we can now measure many genes, many single cells and modalities, and we can go to spatial transformation. So you sort of bring up the, the, the spatial context again. 
So it's, I think, really fun, fun to look at it. And I think just this, this year, I think basically pretty much now, you know, Merscope has been out, you know, now I think also with, with, with multiple other vendors bringing out true single cell resolved assays, not just sort of 10 cell averages or so. I think a, a lot of exciting, uh, possibilities are, are possible and you know just just the december issue of nature biotech it features uh the, the nano strings uh, um and in situ approach pretty exciting so cool data we need to bring our tools ready for that and for example together uh, we together with the ome consortium uh, colleagues in particular um Oli stegler um here giovanni from my lab been pushing models to then also really have a good data structure in the background this extends on our squid data structure and allows now also sort of for for different regions and really for subcellular resol resolution of, of transcripts to be included as a data structure. And then you can build models on top of this. And we have a bunch of vignettes on, on sort of how to use this type of data uh, already in SquidPy. If you just want to check it out, go to SquidPy and check out the Xenium or uh, Cosmics vignette. So what, what, what type of approaches can be done there? This is from a review that we, that we did recently together with Aviv, where you could, you know, as, as, as usual, of course, we can build clusters of cellular expression. You can talk a, a, about that. But now if you have spatial information, you can maybe see where something subcellular is resolved. And you can maybe look into um, morphology or you can look about in interactions or maybe find tissue mo modules. So I think this, 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 yeah, and, and you might maybe even go, 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 go um, um, multimodal on top of that, either imputed or, or in reality. And I think one of the key challenges we still face there is that you know, we have this cell type metaphor in the disassociated setting. It's so important for us to think about these bins in order to describe this complex data, this complex 20,000 dimensional many sample type of thing. But what's the equivalent in space? You know, we, let's say we have 100 spatial uh, observations of, of a lung or a, a, a particular organ or, sub, or, or, or a subsection. They would all look a little bit different, right? What type of concepts are shared across this. So I think this, this notion of a niche or maybe also of a more global shared structure will need it to be asked again and maybe also really written up in a proper defined fashion. And, you know, in, in that review, yeah, we then quantified a bunch of sort of challenges that you could see from, from the uh, um, analysis side, which I won't now really uh, uh, go into detail because I don't want to, to take too long. Um, um, yeah, I, maybe I can just like highlight one. You know, I think like this old, this 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 old pre-processing, I think is going to be a big thing. And with these targeted essays, the feature selection could be quite fun. So really saying, hey, how can we design a, a useful probe set to then follow up on that? And this is actually work that that Louis and and Malte have been doing in the lab. That's just out in bioarchive, and I, I'm just going to skip this for now. So the last uh, two things I, I wanted to mention. In this case, it's it's a it's about the the the, the, the phenotypes. So, you know, in, in the end, we want to make that stuff useful, right? So you want to sort of try it out maybe in a clinical setting, or I mean that's not this particular developmental system better, but you know, we always want to now combine this not only with multimodalities, but like with a downstream readout effect of a drug, but maybe you know, also sort of differential comparison in a particular disease setting or dynamics or something like that. So this inclusion of, of a phenotype, I think, is really important. And mostly we do this with different differential analysis, I would say at the moment, but I think that, that we, we could be doing more. And this is one thing that I briefly wanted to show. This has been something that I've been basically, I think kind of thinking about for three or four years is using this, this technique for machines called multiple instance learning in our setting. What does it mean? Well, you know, let's say, and this is obviously simplified. We don't want to just make a classified prediction, but you know, once we have it, we can interpret it. Let's say we want to, we have these two different states and we want to predict something. So how do we deal with, uh, um, with, with this prediction problem. Well, you know, obviously we do single cell sequencing, you might maybe do multiple modalities and then we have our predictor. So now the idea from multiple instance learning is as follows. The, the, the thing, what, what, what it means is that instead of having a predictor per cell, you have a, you have a, a label per cell, you have a label for a ensemble of cells, for a bag of cells, for a set of cells, okay? Or cell sets of instances. This is why it's called multiple instance learning. So in this particular case, for example, you have a, a healthy and a bunch of, 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 of diseased ones. And for each one, not each not a particular cell is healthy or diseased, but this ensemble is. And for example, this one, maybe then the orange one's driving it or something like that, in this, this toy example. So the idea is you have to learn by aggregating back information. 
And this is not a completely new or something like that idea. You know, people in computer vision, particularly microscopy, have been using this for a long time because these images, are, these slides are usually too large so that you go into to multiple patches and then you make an ensemble predict on that. And particularly using also attention-based techniques. I think this is a paper from Max Welling have been really sort of popularizing this idea of and also seeing where, where, the, where this method looks into. So this is something we can do in our setting. This is uh, a work by Anastasia and, and, and Mo in the lab where you, you, know, you, you, you do your predictor, you do your typical encoder as we have. You, we here write it up for multimodal version, but this, it's not, not really crucial for now. But the key thing is usually we do it per sample. Now, because we want to learn it on an ensemble, we now take a whole bag. So we take all the cells from one patient or subject, and, and not all, typically like 100 subsamples or something, like that, and we aggregate across this. And we aggregate by taking weights we have weights, that's why it's called attention, and we pool these. And then you just have your predictor. And with this, you can see which cell is actually now decisive for this prediction. And you can also use this now to query. It's a bit of a beast to train, but seems to be working out now. And now we can, for example, for example apply this here to, to predict um, this disease uh, uh, stage and patterns in, in, in a side seek PPMC atlas for different COVID stages. And again, I, I won't be able to show you details, but the key point I'm trying to make here is that if you take a gene expression predictor, so just sort of propagate the label healthy, mild, severe to a, a, a down, down there, then you know, see, yeah, you do an okay job. If you do this on a pseudobar, you say relative cell type frequencies change. And this is, you know, often a, a big phenotypical observation, you get better. But if you take this, um, we call it multigrade, so this multiple instance learning across multiple modalities, then you can actually really um, 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 get this work. This is not always is as, as good as this, but this case was really working out nicely. And the cool thing is you then can look into why this is the case. So not just in the pseudobark, but really fully look into which cells sort of driving one particular state, and you can then analyze this. So um, I have, I, I want to say something about multimodalities and scales. I, I will skip this because I think you would expect what it is. So can we need to add more modalities and, you know, we can um, potentially now learn about the tissue modules. I just want to spend the last two minutes, if, if I may, Barbara. Yes, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> on uh, the fact that, you know, in order to enable this, I think we need good tools. So I think the engineering aspect or the... I don't know how you want to call it. I just call it engineering. The tooling aspect, I think, is important. We see this so much. So at, at least, you know, when, when we started doing single cell analysis ages ago and things didn't work out, we had to set up this, this, this scan pipe back and that really was helping us then sort of tie a lot of, sort of diverse loose ends in the lab together and then later it became popular. And I think now in the spatial setting, I really hope we can maybe also go in, in, a, in sort of maybe a similar sort of background thing where we can then attach our tools on top. And I think also this connection between the R and the Python world is working quite nicely nowadays with, you know, trying to be able to exchange sort objects into ScanPy and vice versa. And uh, I think a, a really interesting observation that that uh, Luke Post took in the lab and who set up this database, single cell RNA tools quite some time ago, even much before he joined my lab, was making was that he saw that there's now like the number of tools that our field does is just increasing and exploding. So how to tie together, how to sort of know what to do. And, uh, you know, then he sort of did some trends and he saw sort of what important things are coming. So I think it's a really nice database to, to look into. But what we at least observed in Python is that there's a bunch of sort of core packages that, that pull things together. And this is ScanPy and data, but then also a, a bunch of, 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 of other um, uh, approaches, um, particularly now also if you go multi, uh, multimodal, moon, and so on. So we set up this thing called SCverse, which I think is a really uh, a fun in initiative um, spearheaded by Francesca, Jose, uh, Ania, uh, Oli, but then also a, a really strong team of, of uh, advisors where we try to have a core data structure at the center then it's a set of core packages that build and use this data structure and are jointly maintained. Because you know, we, this, this maintaining software yourself doesn't scale. So that's why we try to exchange and really make this jointly. And this is actually helping. And then a clear description how you know an ecosystem can buy into that. And we're trying to then also do sort of more hackathons. We, for example, just the last week, uh, Isaac and, and Joanne organized a hackathon for, uh, for doing documentation of SCverse. You know, people really got getting in, uh, I think, I think into that. And I'm very excited about this sort of as, as a, a, a next sort of mini bioconductor type of thing, maybe in, in, in our Python setting. And I think it's really an easy entry point and it's a nice community. So really, please, I kindly ask you to participate, contribute, um, give some comments and just make sure this really helps you. And last but not least, we often do hackathons within the lab as well. And out of one, it, 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 we sort of to, to sort of see how do we do things. 
there's a lot of benchmarks around uh, this 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 book single cell best practices came out in particular lucas and anna pi, pi pushed but you know a lot of people contributed um not just within the lab but also with many inter interactions and uh, we kind of want this to be if that's possible something like a living resource to be done for and with the community so if you have interest in and want to provide feedback and be really critical also about it please please check it out it's been a bit of a massive undertaking. We're going to put some some sort of text, a uh, smaller condensed version out as well. But I think for us, it has a bunch of also vignettes to use. I, I, I just want to advertise this. So with this, my center letter is done. I mentioned all of these topics. And um, now I want you to get active while maybe Barbara opens the room for questions or so. And I just share um, this, this website here. So these were the topics that I, I raised. If you go to menti.com and use this code up there, you could, uh, and I can also copy the link and put it in the chat, would be super nice if you could maybe give me and all of us your feedback of what you think Single Cell 23 will be all about. Thank you so much for your attention and thanks Barbara for sharing. Thank you very much Fabian for this really great uh, overview and uh, fantastic wishes for, for the next year. Um, yeah, so now there is time for questions. And as I said, you can either raise your hand uh, and then speak up or you can write your question in the chat. And I must say, you really broke the record here in terms of participation. We had like at the peak 318 participants. I think this is awesome, fantastic <laughs> for the for this final uh, lecture of this year. Yeah, maybe I can start with a question. So I'm I'm wondering for as as a New Year resolution for the for the experimentalists here. Uh, I I wonder what what lessons you have learned from assembling so many data sets in, for example, in this massive lung atlas, because, you know, so I'm wondering, is there still gain to apply different, let's say just single cell transcriptomics, is there gain to, uh, to apply different methods or is it fine? Everyone focuses on 10 genomics or, uh, you know, um, yeah. This, yeah, maybe this, starting there. Like, what is there anything you learned about what we should do as experimentalists when we work on atlases? Um, yeah, I, I think thanks for raising this. So I think one of the really important things is now uses for experimental design, right? And uh, in 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 the lung, I mean, one thing we saw is that this seems to be rather robust to integrate across various droplet base, for example, you know, different primed N ten X and 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 other assays. What we haven't yet done, and I think it's actually not that easy, is to say, hey, when are we actually done? So let's say you oh, let's say you know we can do more and more healthy, let's say maybe healthy of a similar genetic background. At some point, there's there just can't be necessary to do more single cells, right? At some point, I mean PBMCs, maybe we we will reach saturation. But how to properly formulate that is 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 not not super, super trivial. There's been a um, a, a, a PI here in Munich, Matthias Heinrich, he has been doing this thing called SE Power, which I just put in the chat. It's like a power analysis for, for single cell analysis. It's like, like Raoul's, you remember Raoul's how many cells thing? Yes. And this is sort of a bit of a more fancy version that, that uses differential expression quantities. And that really tells you, like in this particular essay, if, if you want to have this differential expression, this is sort of maybe how many cells you'd use. And I think this could be and should be maybe extended towards multiple modalities or essays as you ask right so you know what would you gain if you did that um I'm not sure if he's working on that but i think it's a cool suggestion mm -hmm. i would take that up and and if you if you were to include other I, I mean if we have all the space open for another modality what would be your favorite modality when it comes to um yeah predicting at to, going towards predictive biology predicting perturbations well my favorite one uh, would, would it be, be rather do we need other modalities or do you think we just need a lot of perturbation measurements with a single cell transcriptomic readout that is already sufficient I, I mean in terms of modality what i would really like to have just to because this is like not yet fully around would be really protein because you know that's sort of what does do a lot of things obviously so you know if, if there was some possibility to really now better get this in in single cells and Matthias Mann here locally is, yeah. is working on some of these these cool essays as, as well as quite a few others. 
and he has been able to downscale down, down things. Maybe, you know, I think there's also a possibility of extracting RNA at the same time, and then you can really estimate translation rates and so on. And I think mm -hmm. that could be exciting for really getting towards a regulatory model, right? But I think you have a point. I think if you really perturb the heck out of things, um, and even though you in, you only observe part of the, right, we will never be able to observe sort of full yeah. state, right? I, I think you can in, in, infer a lot of dynamics. I mean, with your pando, you show that you can extrapolate or or Sam, she has been really quite extensively testing uh, this approach. So I, I I could I could really see, I'm, I'm actually really excited uh, that this GRN inference could be, could be happening. And so, yeah, I, I, I think in the future, we will not be measuring all modalities always at the same time. Like, you know, in, in genome browser, we just sort of go and when we load in the other track. And I think this other track is essentially like imputing in now one or the other modality because you have been measuring it. Raul calls it bridging and there's a bunch of other. Yeah, tracks. exactly. Bridge integration. Yes. Hmm. So we have a large audience. That's, ah, there is a question coming. Great. <laughs> A question from Marta. Hi, Fabian. Thanks for the amazing talk. Maybe this is a very naive question, but do you think it could be feasible to try to integrate meta cells generated from many different data sets used to build an atlas with an autoencoder keeping in consideration that meta cells should, in principle, solve sparsity issues related to single cells? Yeah, I, I, I have not been so we we already did this this Praga thing, which for me was sort of the scalable version of of Metacell, and then uh, Amos came up with this I think really precise definition of you know this the, the in, in, uh, intrinsic variation, and I I think that there's there's definitely something that that I mean I personally just haven't looked so so, so much into, but I think this sort of resolving sparsity maybe is not necessary to really do on a single sample basis, you know in in, in machine we have like so so many samples that are noisy you know it's like you'd say you have typically have images that are always a bit blurred a bit strange like you know and and still people don't throw them out they don't sort of curate and make the best pretty image but just like throw a whole bunch of images in and you know then you you learn from it similar i think in single cell i think it's totally okay that we have sparse number of reads but because we have so many so many close by reads and you know the reads are usually still enough to know what's close by then if you locally average you get a good thing that's essentially what meta cells is doing right so i can see doing this explicitly or doing implicitly by just learning the close proximity in a, in a latent space. I think both of them sort of will, will end at, at this at this same thing. But um, I think thinking about it is a good idea. Um, I, I just realized that, I don't know if, if you saw Barbara in this in situ approaches, I mean, you get a crazy number of cells, but they're even more sparse than what we're used to. I, I didn't realize this is like a hundred fifty transcripts or something like that per cell. So it's super super sparse. So then you know, Marta, you're you're there again. Yes, and and I agree that that like moving forward, also the feature selection for spatial analysis uh, analysis will be very interesting. Actually, that's a good point. You know How what we did like with this 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 one thing this 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 uh, Kumela at I paper. We just said not only cell type markers like differentiate with cells, but within a cell type, try to keep variation maximal, sort of to see substates, right? Because that's kind of what, what you want to get. But I think if there's more spatial data available, you could also use this other spatial data to say, hey, maybe these few transcripts really vary in interesting fashion. You build this into your marker selection. Yes. Are there more questions from the audience? We are reaching the, at the end of our seminar, it's 10, 16 already, but maybe anyone, ah, there's another question, great, by Aline Dupont. Hi Fabian, thank you for the really interesting talk. I wanted to know your perspective about the increasingly huge influence and usage of deep learning based methods for many of DL based analysis, but then it also raises questions about explainability of these complicated models, do you think? Don't you, you know, think? <laughs> I, 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 you know, of, of course, you know, I, I think this will be the future because this is the the thing that scales and pretty much all of the machining has been showing us that it, it, obviously for analysis, not, but like for, for, for learning a, a best predictor, best embedding zone, it's just going to be so hard to beat these super flexible things. And, you know, for example, we did this graph neural network cell cell communication. It turns out it's really good to stay in that framework because a lot of compute gets easier. A lot of, 
you know, optimization, you can use these GPU based backend things. And, and, you know, there's formulation for how to deal properly with this graph based structure. Turns out that the linear model was actually doing a good job. So you can screen very through many model complexities. And even though it's maybe deep learning based, you know, we call it deep learning. But if you check out, I think most of the current papers are not deep in any case. You know, like, you know those autoencoders have two or three layers at most. So, you know, we screen through and we don't need deep. So deep at the moment is not yet there. I said this in one slide that I think with more and more samples, we might get deep. But the solution that computer vision or now, I mean, I think all of you saw this chat GPT and so on. I mean, isn't that awesomely crazy what these things can do? And, you know, interpretation of what these model, models do is something that they're currently dealing with. But that the main trick is that they can now reuse these models as just a wrapper and then do something with it. And I think for us, similarly will be, there's going to be like the Atlas for a lung or whatever. And then we use this one and then just have this outside. It's super well trained. And within then we do our mapping of a new cell type and so on. And then we do our downstream analysis. So I think you would just use these as filters, like as new features. Like now you go maybe in cell profile and you get a feature of roundness of a cell and then you have sort of a, a deep learning based feature. So I think this, this could come as well. All right. Thank you very much, Fabian. I think we end with this. Um, yeah, again, thanks to everyone for coming. February 1st is the next edition, 4 p.m. on Wednesday. And wishing you all happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, happy holidays, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.